I invite you now to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be focusing our attention on Romans 8, beginning in verse 28, down through the end of the chapter. You know, every time we begin a new year, there's always a level of uncertainty because, well, frankly, none of us know what's going to happen. Uh, none of us are predictors of what's going to take place. Uh, none of us, a year ago, predicted that we would be spending most of our time at home in 2021. Uh, none of us predicted that what was then a, a great economy would suddenly plummet and there would be significant job losses uh, throughout the United States. Uh, Donna and I, uh, our, in our personal life, we didn't know a year ago that Donna would battle cancer for, for most of 2021. On the other hand, we also didn't know or anticipate that we'd welcome a new granddaughter into the world in, in 2020. And so uh, we, we look into a new year and we have aspirations, we have hopes, some of us set goals, but there's always a level of uncertainty because none of us know for sure what the new year is going to bring. There are people that predict, and uh, you can always read what psychics think, or even those that are paid to predict the future, and you'll discover that in almost every case, they're wrong. Uh, one of the things that was supposed to happen in 2020, according to those that uh, are scientists and supposedly know these things, is that we would be vacationing on moon uh, by this time in 2020. We'd have vacation homes that we would travel to uh, for, uh, for part of this year. That certainly uh, has not worked out. But in a world of uncertainty, we are able to have certainty about key things, key things that we can count on and be confident of because they don't come from me, they don't come from anyone else, they come from God himself. This morning, I want us to think together about three certainties that we can be absolutely certain of for 2021. And they come to us from our text in Romans chapter 8. And so let me read that for you, and you can follow along in, uh, in your Bibles or on the screen, beginning in verse 28. This is the Word of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray one more time. Our Father, we thank you that once again we're able to come and hear you speak to us through your word. And we rejoice that we have a, the, the text that is before us today, the encouragement that it gives us, the, the confident hope that it provides us. And so we ask that uh, you would bless the one who's bringing the word today, enabling him to speak clearly, and we pray that your spirit would use your word proclaimed powerfully 
and our lives. Grant to us the grace that we would receive your word in faith and we would respond to your word appropriately for your praise. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So, I said in this text that there are three certainties that we can have to, as a congregation, as, as believers, as we look into the future. I, I want to say that all three things are certain for believers, but only for believers. So if you haven't come to a point in your life where you've trusted in Christ, it's good for you to hear these things, but these promises are not for you. Uh, not until you come and in humility bend the knee to Christ and receive Him as your Savior. But for all believers, the first certainty is found there in verse 28. That no matter what happens in 2021, we can be certain and have a guarantee that God is going to use all of those circumstances for our ultimate good. You'll notice in verse 28, the, uh, the verb that's used there is work together. Uh, God is the subject of that verb, and it's a compound verb, uh, and it means uh, to cooperate or to help. Uh, God is saying here that he's going to take all of the events that happen in your life, all the circumstances that you face in this coming year, and he's already promised that he'll work together to bring these things to a point where they will turn out for your good, even if it doesn't feel good while you're going through them. Now, notice that the goal for God is your good. Now, he's going to define that for us in, in just a few moments, down in verses 29 and 30. But good here is God's plan for your life. And God's plan for you is so much better than any plan you could put together for yourself. None of us would have put together a plan in 2020 that we'd be living in the midst of a pandemic, that all of life would be disrupted and turned upside down. We wouldn't have chosen that plan, but God did. And God has been working in ways in your life through the pandemic months to do things in you that you would have missed out on entirely if you had been the one to determine your future. Some of us have experienced a, a, a time of great blessing with family because uh, we've been able to spend more time with them. Uh, we've experienced a time of, of slowing down, uh, some of us, because uh, we, we just aren't able to do all the things that we once did. Now, others of us have felt like life has been much more hectic during the pandemic. And in that as well, God has been teaching us and, and working in our lives. God promises this is what he's going to do for you in the coming year as well. And notice he promises that it is, according to verse 28, in all things. Every aspect, every circumstance that comes into your life, God is going to use for your ultimate good. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that only good things are going to come into our life. We, we just sang, blessed be your name. We acknowledged as we sang that there are days of sunshine and, and warmth and glorious days where everything is going well. There's also days of darkness. There's days of hardship. There's days that we think we can just barely get by. But in all of those circumstances, God is at work. And in all of those circumstances, he's using those things in our life to accomplish the ultimate good for us. And so we know that whether it's health or illness, whether it's a promotion or being laid off, whether it's riches or poverty, in all of these circumstances, God is at work using both good and bad, as we describe them, to do that which he knows is best for us and best for our lives. We know God can accomplish this because he's sovereign and because he's powerful. There is nothing that has happened in 2020 in your life that God did not decree and determine to do. And there is nothing that's going to happen in your life in 2021 except God has already from all eternity past determined to do because it's that which is best for you. Not only is God sovereign 
and decrees whatsoever comes to pass, but in his decree, he also determines to give you that abundant grace to sustain you and uphold you in the midst of all those circumstances. God has a plan for your life. And in that plan, part of his plan is to sustain you, to uphold you, to give you the grace and the mercy that you need, no matter what you're facing. You will never be alone in the new year, even as we read in Psalm 121. God will be your protector. God will be your keeper. God will sustain you and use everything in your life for his purpose and plan. You remember that when Joseph had been sold into slavery uh, into Egypt and he, he was raised up by God to, uh, to save actually the world as, as he knew it at the time. His brothers came to him. And Joseph's response to them was, you meant this for evil, selling me into slavery. But God meant it for good. We often don't see and understand immediately what God's intentions are. It's looking back that we can begin to understand God's plan and why it's perfect. Be certain that in this coming year, God's plan for your life will be perfect. That God will do exactly what he and his infinite wisdom knows that you need and will give you the grace under all of those circumstances to sustain you. That's number one. The second certainty that we are confident about going into 2021 is seen in verses 29 and 30. And that is God promises that he will continue to complete the work of your salvation. Now, remember back in verse 28, he told us that God is working for our good, but he didn't really define it in verse 28. It's in verses 29 and 30 that God defines what good is from his perspective for us. And this is what God's good plan for you is. God is using all these things that are happening in your life in order for you to reach the ultimate goal that he has for you, that you be conformed to the image of his son. Now in scripture, uh, the image of God is used through, throughout the scriptures. In the book of Genesis, we're told that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them in his image. But the fall occurred. And when the fall occurred, Adam and Eve remained image bearers, but that image was distorted by sin. It's, it's like looking into a, a mirror that's distorted and you, you don't see your true self. And, and, and when we look at each other, we don't see the true image of God. But salvation is God's plan to restore the image of Christ in us. And so the, the fullness of salvation, when that occurs in our lives, we will be fully conformed once again, renewed and conformed to the image of Christ and ready to begin eternity with him. Now, there's a process that God's using to accomplish that. And so you see these in verses 29 and 30. That process is a chain of events, a chain of, of salvation that focuses on different aspects of salvation. And you'll notice the chain begins there. Let me read verses 29 and 30 again. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is an unbreakable chain of salvation. When he begins, God always completes and the chain is never broken. So the first aspect of salvation that Paul points to is that it begins with God for knowing his people. Now in scripture, we, we need to be careful when we think about God, because when it says that God foreknows something, it's not that he intellectually knows something in advance. God knows everything in advance, but that's not the point of this word. The point of the word is those that God foreknows, he loves 
with a special love. And so you have passages, for example, in Psalm 1-6 that says the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but he doesn't know the way of the wicked. He knows the way of the righteous in the sense that he has a relationship with them. We, we refer to, to knowing our spouse as a, as a way of speaking of the, the intimacy of a relationship that we can have with him. God foreknew in the sense that he foreloved the people that he was determined to stay. Before eternity began, he loved you. He loved you in Christ and was determined to save you out of the abundance of his love. Everyone that he foreknew, it goes on to say, he also predestined. God, out of his great love for you, determined beforehand what your destiny would be. God saw you in sin, but he determined that he was saving you and that your destiny would not be his wrath, which you deserve, but it would be glory. It would be heaven. It would be a relationship with him. And that's what God had in mind for you. Again, from all eternity. In Ephesians 1 that we looked at a few weeks ago, we saw that God's predestination was motivated by his love. Because he loved you, he predestined you to be with him. Just the same order that we see here in verses 29 and 30. And everyone whom he predestined, he also called. This is a reference to God's effectual call. It's the, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. So that everyone that, that God has loved, everyone whom he's predestined, he's also called. The work of the Holy Spirit has worked in your life, and, and the Holy Spirit was sent to, to all of the elect at some point in their life to convict them of their sin, to give them a new heart and a new will, to give them faith to trust in Jesus Christ alone. And God has done this in your life, and he does it in the life of everyone that he's determined to save. And not only does he call us, but in this unbroken chain, he comes and he gives to us the grace of justification. We, we've seen before that justification is a legal term. And in this legal term, it's a, it's a courtroom scene. And, and there in the courtroom, the judge, who is God the Father, declares us to be innocent. More than that, declares us to be righteous, positively righteous, because of the work that Jesus Christ has done for us. Because Christ uh, willingly lived a life upon this earth as we've celebrated this past Christmas and, and willingly lived in obedience to the Father. He was able to earn righteousness for us and that righteousness has been given to us. And so we stand before God not as the sinners that we are in ourselves, but as righteous because we're in Christ. Everyone who's been called experiences that justification. And then finally, notice in verse 30, he, the last thing he refers to is, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Notice that too is in the past tense. All of the others have been things that have happened to us sometime in the past if we're believers today. But Paul talks about our glorification, which won't happen until the end of time, as if it's already occurred. Because we have such certainty about what God is going to do and what God is going to accomplish. At the time of our glorification, it's when we will be completely conformed to the image of Christ in all aspects of our being. All of our sins are removed. All the effects of sin are, are taken away. We're transformed and we're glorified in the image of the glorified, resurrected Lord. And that's what God's plan is for you. So that you can spend eternity with Him. And you can spend eternity with Christ, who then will be shown as the firstborn of many brothers and sisters as He brings us to reign with Him for all eternity. This is what God is accomplishing. Note again, look down at verses 29 and 30. All of those steps of salvation are the work of God alone. You were passive in all of them. 
we can be confident as to what God is doing and what God will accomplish because it's God who's doing the work. If one of those steps were up to me, I could not have certainty about my eventual glorification. If I was responsible for my justification, there would be no certainty or hope that I would ever get to glorification. It's only because God is the one who does all these things that God is to be praised and we can be certain because it's He who's doing all the work. There are a lot of plans and projects that were started in 2020 that are still not completed. And I suspect that that's one of the reasons why many people don't look forward to a new year because it's a reminder of things that are yet undone. Uh, there, there was that uh, craft project that you started and you thought, oh, through the pandemic, I, I certainly will get this done. And it still is not completed. There's that lamp that you have told yourself Saturday after Saturday after Saturday, I've got to fix that. And you never, never got to it. There's the will or the uh, the, the trust that you were going to set up and, and see that all those things were squared away. And, and perhaps you began, but you just never completed it. That's part of what it means to be human, unfortunately. We begin things and we don't finish them. Your God never begins something that he doesn't complete. The God who in eternity past loved you and determined to save you is the God who in eternity future you will be present with because he's gone through the whole process and glorified you and made you completely conform to the image of Christ. We can be certain that in 2021, God's going to continue to complete that work. He'll continue to work in your life and point out your sin to you and, and cause you to recognize how you've fallen away. When that happens, don't get morbid, don't get sad, but, but rejoice. It's the evidence that God's working in your heart and, and respond with repentance and, and with joy that there's forgiveness in Christ. Throughout 2021, he's going to continue to encourage you as you read his word and, and cause you to recall things that you've read and studied before in the very time and moment that you need them. God will continue the work that he's begun, and you'll experience that in this coming year. Well, one last certainty, and that is found in verses 31 through 39. You can be certain in this coming year, that you will not fall away or be separated from God's love. In verses 31 through 39, we see a conclusion. It's a conclusion, actually, to the entire first eight chapters of Romans. But it's also a fitting conclusion to verses 29 and 30. God has a plan. He's working his plan out. How do I know that I'll be able to persevere through the plan? Because God also makes certain that you're never separated from that love that he showed you in the very beginning of time. God loves you, according to these verses, with a deep love from which you can never face separation. You can never be cut off from the love that God has for his people. Notice in verse 32, we are told that God's love is not just words. It's not just saying, I'll do something. But it's based on what he's already done for us. Verse 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That verse looks back to the book of Genesis. And you remember that God comes to Abraham and says to Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, the son that you love, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And Abraham in faith went up to the mountain and was about to plunge the knife into his son to, to obey God's word. And God stopped him. And he spared Isaac and brought the ram to be the sacrifice in Isaac's place. But centuries later, on a hill called Golgotha, God did not intervene. 
he did not spare his son, but allowed his son to experience horrors and the wrath of God and experience hell because he loved us. And in order to save us, he was willing to sacrifice his son. How can we question whether that God will continue to love us? How can we wonder if that God will, will finally get tired of us and cast us away? How can we think that God would let us fall away if he's already expressed his love in such a significant way? The love of God is meant for us to have great confidence in. In fact, God tells us here in the text of the things that can't separate us from his love. Notice in, in verses 33 and 34, our sin can't separate us from God's love. It's looking back on a passage in Isaiah 50, uh, where God is seen sitting on the throne, ready to pass judgment. But Christ is also there, and he's the advocate, the, the one who intercedes, the, the lawyer for, for God's people. And God's people are acquitted because of the, the intercession of Christ and the work that he's done. Because Christ has already done all the work, we can never be separated from God because of our sin. Because our sin has been pardoned. Our record has been expunged. Uh, there is no record anymore of our sin in God's eyes because Christ has already paid for that. Praise God that there's no sin that you can commit that puts you beyond the pale of God's love, that puts you beyond the ability uh, to, uh, uh, to receive pardon and forgiveness because of what Christ has already done. According to verse 35, there are no circumstances that will come into your life that will cause you to be separated from him. Even if God calls us to go through uh, illness and even serious illness, even if we go through suffering, even if we face death, in all of those things, we're never separated from God's love. God is present with us in his love through all of those circumstances and promises to be in the coming year. And finally, notice in verses 38 and 39, it tells us that there's nothing that's been created that can separate you from the love of God. Satan cannot come and separate you from God's love. You can't do something to separate yourself from God's love. When God elects someone and saves them through the work of Christ, he gives to us the grace of perseverance. He causes us to, to persevere and he preserves us so that we're kept by him in that relationship. If you are a believer today, you will not experience anything in 2021 that will cause God to desert you, that will cause God to be separated from you, but he will keep you and protect you, even as we saw once again in Psalm 121. These verses I discovered later in my life were the favorite verses of my father. Early in his Christian life, he was shown these verses in Romans 8 about not being separated from God's love. And he said, I was so overwhelmed and so amazed that there was nothing that could ever happen to take me away from my God, to take me away from his love. That sense of amazement, that sense of overwhelming joy ought to be for all of us as we contemplate who our God is and the, the promises that he's given to us. He's not a God like the, the pagan gods or the, the idols of, uh, of former days who, uh, who were never uh, faithful, who were never content, who, who kept changing their minds and, and, and requiring new things from their people. Our God is faithful from the beginning to the end, just as his love is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. But the result of never being able to be separated from his love is that which we see in verse 37. Because nothing can take us away from God, we are conquerors. He says there, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Every day, we're involved in the same spiritual battle. 
Every day we do battle with the world and the flesh uh, and, 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 and Satan. And we do this battle every day relying upon the grace of God. And every day we can be confident that we will not be overwhelmed. We will never be separated from Christ due to our spiritual failings and and due to our sins because we already are conquerors in Christ. Uh, The the verb that's used there, more than conquerors, this is the only place in the New Testament that this uh, particular verb is used, and it means that we conquer overwhelmingly. It's not that we just barely get by and barely win the battle with Christ. But we overwhelmingly conquer because it's not done in our strength. It's done in the strength of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's done in the strength of the omnipotent, powerful God who loves us and keeps us to the end. Satan will try his best, but he will never overwhelm us. Satan will try to steal us away from God, but Christ holds on to us. In all these things, we will conquer in 2021 because it's Christ who conquers through us. The Greeks had the idea in the first century that humans never win victories, that victories are always won by their gods. And so I've I've mentioned before that Nike is the Greek god of victory. Our victory will not come because we've been spiritually strong. Our victory will come because we have an infinitely strong Savior who holds on to us, who protects us, and who promises to take us to victory. Philip Melanchthon was a a Lutheran theologian uh, uh, following Luther. Luther was brash and bold and loud and, and all of those things. Melanchthon was quiet studious. He'd he'd be defined as soft rather than hard. The verse that impressed him the most through his life, he said, was verse 31. Let me read that for you again. If God is for us, who can be against us? He quoted this verse over and over again in his writings. And it was the verse that was on his lips when he died were told by those who were witnesses. Melanchthon understood that if God is for us, nothing else matters. Congregation, I want you to know that as we begin a new year, and there are uncertainties that we don't have any idea as to what's going to happen, there is one certainty, and if you, if you forget everything else that I've said, remember this one point. According to Romans 8.31, God is for you. You don't start the year wondering, is God going to be against me? Is God going to be neutral? What, what, how is God going to deal with me? God says, I'm for you. And I've already showed you this in Jesus Christ. Because God is for you, you can be certain that he's going to use every event and circumstance in your life for your ultimate good. You can be confident that God is going to continue to work through the process of salvation for you until you're fully conformed to the image of Christ. And because God is for you, you can be certain that nothing will be allowed to separate you from his love. But that infinite and eternal and unchangeable love will be yours every moment of every day of 2021. Because God is for us, 2021 is going to be a good year because we're in God's hands. Let's pray. Father, as we face a new year, some of us face it with great excitement and joy because we're excited to see what you're going to do and what the new year will bring. Some of us, Father, are much more timid of a new year. We're much more overwhelmed and we're filled with sorrow of what we didn't do in this past year. But Father, give to us all a confident hope about the new year. Because we know you are for us. We know that you're working in us and through us. 
And we know that your promises are certain and true because you're a faithful God. We praise you that from the beginning of time you had already loved us in Christ. And at the end of all time, your plan for us will be completed as we're conformed to our Savior's image. In this coming year, give us that confidence in you, that faith to rest in you and in your good plan for us. And by your grace, enable us to bring glory to you, no matter the circumstances. In these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.